Good evening. It's Wednesday, March 10th, 2021. I'm Joe, the pastor at First Presbyterian Church here in Smithfield, North Carolina, in the heart of Johnson County. Welcome to all of you as we gather for this evening reflection and sharing God's word for one another. Thank you for being here with us. And I wanted to begin with a quote I had shared on social media earlier this week. It's taken from uh, the German Christian pastor and also martyr, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was imprisoned and executed uh, shortly before the end of World War II by the Nazis. And here are his words. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. Those words have resonated with many who read the post this week. We do get so busy, and when an interruption comes along, we are called as people of faith to be open to those disruptions in our lives. A year ago, when the coronavirus began, uh, we felt like our world had been turned upside down. But for many people of faith, we have seen the hand of God very present, the hand of providence moving in our lives during this time. On Sunday, I shared another story about a God interruption in our lives. This one was more violent. Jesus is clearing the temple. He turned over the tables of the money changers, and he just created a general ruckus, as we say in the South. John chapter 2 verses 18 through 22. The Jewish authorities then said to Jesus, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then Jesus, uh, then the Jews said to Jesus, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Even for the disciples, even with the Jewish authorities uh, challenging Jesus and his teaching, nobody really understood who and what he was about until the day of resurrection came. Now, this is the season of Lent, and it may seem odd to talk about resurrection, but that's exactly what one of my colleagues did this morning. We Presbyterians, we gather in committees all the time. One of my former Baptist friends, she commented, she said, y'all are the meatness folks I have ever seen in my life. And I had the opportunity to gather in commissional ministry today with ministers and elders of our church. You see, we don't have bishops, people to tell us what we are supposed to be doing. We are not independent congregations doing just what we want. We are churches that hold each other and our membership, our leadership accountable for one another. And we work together um, pretty much in harmony and in good spirits most of the time. And yes, we do have a lot of committees, but thankfully not as many as we once did. I want to add one more thing, though, before I dive into the reflection tonight, though. Another thing we Christians of a Presbyterian flavor do is we open and close all these committee meetings, all these gatherings with prayer. We begin in prayer and we end with prayer our way of opening ourselves to God's presence in our conversations, our worship, and our work. And today, my colleague, Georgia Stussy, shared an engaging reflection, at least for me, that with her permission, she said I could pass along to you tonight. So I want to thank Georgia, and here are her words. I thought I'd do a little Google search on Jesus, just to see what I could find. Did you know that if you Google Jesus, you will get about 950 million results? There are about 114 million results for resurrection. But here are some of her discoveries that she shared with us this morning. Guess who owns, owns now, Easter.com. 
Hallmark. Greeting cards, Easter bunnies. If you type in resurrection.com, you know what you get? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's an empty site. Georgia points out wisely to us. Someone is very clever because when you go to resurrection.com, Jesus is not there. The tomb is empty. If you type in Jesus.com, you go to the website of the Metropolitan Community Church. It's the largest denomination founded and committed to a Christian ministry that ministers to people in 22 countries who have historically and theologically felt cut off from the church for many generations. Jesus.org is a little more predictable. It's a Bible study, perhaps a bland one, but it may be an inspiration for some people who go there and need it when they need it. Now here's something that made her feel a little bit braver, and because like many of us, Georgia and we are all worried about the world around us. She said that when she went to Jesus.gov, Christ.gov, and Easter.gov, they are all unused sites. So at least as Americans, we can score one for the separation of church and state. But Jesus, Georgia goes on to write, I wanted to see whatever I could about Jesus like the women did a long ago at the sight of an empty tomb. Despite the differences about some of those details, what we do know is all four gospel writers are in perfect agreement about the only details of this story that really matter. And all four are in perfect agreement about two points. The first is this, that when they go to the tomb, it's empty. The second point is that the telling of the Easter story properly begins with someone going to that empty tomb. And those two truths are the truths that we are called to remember. The resurrection gospel reminds us that God is in control. God is in charge. We don't get to make the rules. We don't get to be in control. God's making the rules, as Georgia writes. But God is in control. God is interrupting us when we think we are so busy about the plans that need to be done. That's when the divine interruptions break into our lives. That's what an empty tomb is all about. And we have to go there to realize the power of God to conquer all things, even death itself. Georgia went on to write, In a few weeks, we will celebrate the miracle of Easter, but the story of Easter officially begins when we go to that empty tomb. I believe that tomb wasn't completely empty. It was full of hope and promise, and God's message that no matter what, good prevails and conquers evil. Love wins. And I think that's good news for all of us. My thanks to Georgia for this reflection, and I'd like to share her closing prayer with us. May these weeks leading up to the tragedy of Good Friday and the glory of Resurrection Sunday remind us of who you are, O oh God, and how you love us. As we continue our walk through this season, may we quiet the noise that puts our attention on lesser things. And forgive us, Lord, for the times we desired a seat at a table you would have overturned. May we see your goodness in new ways throughout this season of Lent. And may we rejoice that you conquered every bit of evil when you rose to life again. Amen. May the Holy Spirit bring us comfort tonight, the light of Christ illumine us, and in that light may the love of Christ abide in us. And above all, may the peace of God be with you until we meet again. Good night.